Hello all and welcome again to the Digital Health and Wearable series. Today we have another magnificent episode with another global leader. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to George Thomas Matthew, which is the Chief Medical Officer of uh, Americas of DXC uh, Technology, a very large enterprise. George, how are you today? doing well thank you for asking oh fantastic to connect so we both in healthcare technology is certainly a very interesting uh, area is a lot is a lot going on with the innovation and the COVID situation and the world of digital transformation in healthcare i have a few questions for you and we're going to try to serve our audience as best as we can and try to help them to understand something is that okay with you So the first point is, how do you think that we can better utilize health data to solve complex and big uh, conditions in healthcare? Health data has always been the purview of healthcare providers for many years. Uh, healthcare workers and nurses have used the data to help patients by interpreting it for them. We have to look at it differently now as we go into 2021 and beyond, where not only the domain of the healthcare professional, it has to belong to the patient. That's the first step, uh, belong to them so they can understand what it means and how to do something with it. But beyond that, as we start looking beyond uh, the old models of healthcare, that data, like all data, has a type of value. And we have to start rethinking our business model of how that data is collected, used, and for, and should somehow incorporate the patient. Oh, right. So, you know, I go to a lot of conferences and we always have this discussion about uh, who owns the data, what can we do with the data, and then we have the ethic, ethical issues about selling the data, not selling, or commercial purposes. But I've been in lots of conferences and uh, I also read a lot of research. For example, if you tell the patient that uh, your health data is used for a good cause, generally, 80% uh, of the cases, people are, are happy to share the data. Personally, I don't have a problem in sharing my health data, but that's just uh, me, you know, everyone is different. So thank you for that. The second question that I have for you is, what is your experience and you work in digital transformation and you experience all these dynamics in, a, in, in your day-to-day day -day, uh, job. Um, what is your experience in main blocks in digital transformation in healthcare? There's a great phrase I learned recently, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, and I think it speaks to the idea that for many digital transformation, many change management in general, um, the issue is that the incumbent processes are very established and generate revenue. It's very difficult to change something that's established when people have subscribed to it and believe it's the best or only way to do something. Uh, that's always been true from for years now with operational excellence and Lean and Six Sigma. And that's true now with digital transformation. People have a difficult time, especially states where we are still very dependent on fee for service. Um, you know, we, we talk about it now in December of 2020 about how we did in nights what we didn't do in 20 years in regards to telehealth and medicine. 
We, the technology existed years ago and the ability to do it existed years ago, but the business processes and the culture were not set up to allow for a competitor to an existing process. If I make good money paying for real estate and overhead, I have a difficult time letting that go. I can justify it tax wise in my country. So why would I change that? The pandemic, when like everything else it did, accelerated that process to, well, I can't physically go, so how do I make it work? And what both practitioners and patients found is they like this. So how that moves forward will be difficult. Um, but I think that's pushing change in the culture to accept digital transformation in healthcare. Wow. Well, thank you. That's very insightful. I'm interested in um, digging in a little bit more into the issues, but uh, um, it's so much to consider, isn't it? I mean, is the culture, the business processes, the commercials, and what you said at the very beginning is very powerful. Also, the reluctancy to change something and start from scratch. And also, it's, it's a loss because when you change something, you have to let go of the old model or of the old implementation or the old technology, whatever that is. And that's a, a, that's a direct cost. Thank you. That, that's very insightful. But, but um, uh, George, tell me a little bit more about other main blocks that you encounter because you see the patient side, but you also see the, technolo the technological side. Tell me other things that should be considered. I mean, the main issues are internal cultural and regulatory, um, for at least here in the States. I believe it's true in other countries as well, but um, we do things uh, our own way here <laughs> where it's um, incentivized, yeah? Uh, people do what they're incentivized to do. In the States, many of the healthcare systems were incentivized to invest in electronic health records. So the majority of them use their money to buy electronic health records that have taken up to five to seven years to implement. Um, but they only did it because they were the right regulatory incentives in place. What we're finding though is those incentives never were structured for interoperability and exchange of data. Uh, they also didn't fully penalize if you restricted access to that data to the patient. So there is a part for regulatory to play the problem that we have, I think it's true everywhere, but obviously here is that, you know, and I've learned this from other smarter people, in the US, one company or sector's inefficiency is another sector's revenue. So, you know, when you look at all the different people that get between the healthcare worker or the doctor or the nurse and the patient, there are insurance companies here, there's pharmaceuticals, there's, um, we call them pharmaceutical benefit managers. Um, there are all these people that basically get in between and want their piece and keep on increasing the share that they want regardless of what's happening to the other pieces. So there needs to be some type of regulatory incentive for transformation um, as well as, as before with culture and established process being very difficult to change. Um, the analogy we use, at least I've heard, uh, is uh, fat and happy. If you are doing well and you are fat and happy, you're less likely to change. Unfortunately, sometimes you need to be in some type of distress to make the change. And the distress has to be great enough to do it. So regulatory and culture. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for shedding light on that. And the regulatory is very complex. For what you said, I interpret that um, it's a bit of a long, a long game that, for example, some structures, um, some small and medium companies that might uh, struggle to compete or do immediate action. So it's a long game. I don't want to go into brands and technologies and players, but for example, Epic, as you know, they've done major transformation. They invest in a long game and they're still investing in a long game. Uh, so it's a lot to consider in here. The culture, I mean, the US, as you mentioned, is probably um, very different than the other markets because it's, there, it's a direct reimbursement in several ways. 
you know, in Europe is slightly different, but we encounter the same the same type of issues around the globe, even in Asia and other places, the implementation of technology is always complex and then you have to skill your people. And so it's always uh, very, very fascinating. We could have a session, we could have an hour, even though the episode is only 15 or 20 minutes, we could have an hour discussing one, one issue on digital transformation or culture. We'll pick one theme and just uh, explode with it. But anyway, thank you, George, that's very insightful. Uh, one uh, last question is, how do you see the healthcare of the future, and it's probably directly linked there, um, evolving with the, with the, in terms of business models, evolving innovation, and you mentioned reimbursement, regulatory, it's probably all kind of linked. What is your view on that? I believe, and again, this is just a belief, um, that it will be more of a global or universal model. It has to be. Um, you know, I, I, I would say that we need to fundamentally rethink what care delivery means. When we start thinking about healthcare 3.0, this really means that the role of the patient goes from being just a passive receiver of care to an active participant. And to do that, you need to elevate and promote the patient. That means uh, educate them, give them the tools and knowledge that they need to make decisions. And that also means that several other sectors have to give up control of both uh, their relationship with the patient, but also financial control as well. Um, the analogy that comes to mind is always with clinical trials. Um, for many years, uh, life sciences companies have taken, at least here, uh, between five and 15 years to develop medications for therapy for patients. And many patients, to your point, have donated their time, their resources, uh, health to discovering the new compounds. Because as you said, I believe most people want to help other people. However, with the new sciences that are coming out uh, with using intelligence and running and predictive modeling to determine you know personalized medicine and genomic medicine that cycle time to develop a new drug is shorter which means that the benefit to that life sciences company comes quicker well where before it was 10 to 15 years and let's say it was a cancer patient that lived for six to eight months if it isn't, nece isn't necessarily uh, because that person realizes it'll go beyond their life. But when that benefit starts to overlap with the lifetime of those patients, the patients, uh, at least the participants in the clinical trial, they probably begin to wonder, well, if they're making so much revenue off of development off of my data, can't I also share in that? benefit can't i use that to help pay for treatment to extend my life further or can't that financial benefit somehow help for paying for my care or help my my family somehow these are the financial choices that need to be available to patients in the future because this is how the data is being used and i i don't have the full baked version of what that will look like but i believe that allowing patients to invest with their data if data financial asset to determine where they would like to go to get the best care and also decide what level of what type of life they want to have. We have stories here where people are extended beyond what is feasible on life saving, uh, life extending machines and medications, but the quality of life is questionable. And we need to find a better way to give people choices so they can make the right choice for them and their families versus, you know, you don't really understand it and I'm not going to tell you. Sign away your data, sign away your consent, and I'll just use it the way I need to because you'd never understand it anyways. And by the way, I'm making more money than you'll ever get. That has to change. There's a, there's a professor here at NYU, Scott Galloway. He describes it as compassionate capitalism that will need to be what underlies a lot of this. How do we actually benefit people when we develop our companies instead of making it a winner takes all? That's my thought. 
Well, that's that's fantastic. I mean, it, it's so complex and so fascinating at the same time. So I do agree with you. We go towards reimbursement in global geographies. Also, what you said is very powerful about um, patient education. Uh, I've been working now for over 20 years and there's always the missing link, the missing gap, educate people, even the simplistic way, even in weight management or stress, whatever that is, even in a simplistic way, it's important to inform people, be um, transparent. Clinical trials is very is very peculiar in a way that we need the people, but uh, it's, it's complex and it's delicate, so information is hidden and then it's not, Part of the information is not hidden. But anyway, so this is fascinating. George, I want to thank you for your time. Before we wrap up, we could have three sessions on each page. <laughs> and before we wrap up, I would like to finish off with a, a minute of time. I mean, it, this is uh, anything you want to share about a shout out about the technology or a, a personal achievement, a, per, a family thing, a, anything whatsoever on your side. A minute of time. So o- over to you. Uh, I I can say that we're. I think I'm doing what everybody else is doing, trying to keep my family safe. My wife is a physician. Uh, she's working during the pandemic time. I'm trying to find time where I can to donate my time, but it's difficult because uh, my family lives with me. So uh, my parents and my my mother-in-law. So we don't want to put them at risk. So you know, going through that. Um, work i believe that our technology stack for dxc technology is probably one of the best in the world because we recognize what we're good at which is analytics and security and uh integration but for the aspects that we're not we have a very strong partner portfolio to fill in the gaps uh one of our companies is a uh, one of our partners is a company called daedalus out of italy um, they have an interoperability solution called open health connect that we use uh, in many countries, I believe, including the UK for NHS, uh, in Saudi Arabia, and to really fully integrate data, um, no matter what the provenance is, harmonize it and allow it for better analytics. So, you know, it's those type of solutions that I feel very confident in that as things develop, we'll be able to support some of these business models of the future. Um, other than that, I, I want to say thank you for inviting me. Um, I don't know if I'd mentioned, I got to come to uh, Portugal last year for the first time to Lisbon. And, you know, I've been involved with a couple of the uh, sessions ever since then with some of the smart hospital work. And I think with some of the initiatives going on with telehealth, um, there are some lessons learned there that hopefully we can learn from you all about what's going on there and bring it over here to the States since we're still playing catch up. Oh, brilliant. Josh, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for sharing your expertise and thanks for the insights and everything. Uh, before I close this episode, I want to acknowledge our sponsors, our global partners, uh, Spirit Digital and other innovators that uh, support us. Uh, please share uh, about the channel, subscribe and share about the channel with everyone in healthcare. I want to create a really big think tank that we can all learn and collaborate and get uh, meaningful insights from each other. But George, many thanks again and, uh, and I'll see you soon. Muito obrigado. Thank you so much. Obrigado.